Tito, Entity on 212. Com check. DPS. Go. Inco. Go. PUS. Go. Surgeon. Go. Booster. Go. Copy that. We have a go from you guys. This is talking sound. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Talking Sound Podcast, the only podcast on the internet where negative 10 is a number to be desired, coming at you live from the throbbing heart of rock and roll that is Austin, Texas. I am Chris Jordan, your host, and here today in the studio, uh, we're back in the main podcast studio. We've been at home for a little while. Uh, We've shot a few things on the road that we're getting ready to release, Uh, and one of the things that we shot... Uh, portably actually led to this episode. Um, You know, even as a professional, even as someone who goes out and does this day after day for a living, that does not mean that you're going to pull the rabbit out of the hat every time. You know, uh, sometimes that rabbit goes to sleep, man. Sometimes the hat door just doesn't work right. You know, we all know it's a trick. We all know it's an illusion. We all know that uh, you know, there is a certain skill set that every engineer brings to the table. However, sometimes things just don't happen. You know, uh, there's a scheduled way things are supposed to happen with the recording. Um, there is a means for that. And, you know, to go through and go through an entire event, um, see that everything is working. Here, so far as you can tell that everything's working right, but whenever you get it back to the studio, come to find out there is a crackle in the line. Um, And what do you do? The the, really the only thing that you can do is have backup in place. Uh, And it was to my chagrin, most of the time it is to the chagrin of the engineer, that they had no backup rolling. Uh, Normally I am a stickler for that. I was on the road, minimal amount of gear, and... You know, fortunately, it was just, it was a personal thing that I was doing, and it didn't come out the way that it should have, because I didn't have the gear with me to do it properly. Um, So, that kind of spawned the idea in my head of, you know, what, what do you need to properly back up data? What do you need to make sure that whenever you are on location, that the record you're getting is the best possible? That... Uh, everything that you're capturing um, is backed up. Everything has more than one means of record happening, and even afterward, assuring the fact that you have a good archiving process, uh, that you're really good at archiving the data, that you're really good at putting down dailies, tracks, songs, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, even even going out and doing on location audio. Uh, for video stuff. You've got to make sure that everything is properly notated for takes and all that kind of stuff. Excuse me. So it is very important to, from the beginning, uh, really start to take notes. Um, And I know that's drilled into a lot of engineering students that go to school for audio, things like that. Um, as well as video students, you know, that you, ha- you have to take notes of your shots. You have to take notes of what you're doing. So that's prime number one. Make sure that you're taking notes. But aside from that, make sure that you have some sort of backup rolling. Now, with my portable rig, you know, I had a small digital recorder going as well as my camera. And this is my typical rig. The only thing is, I mess, I mixed up in my head what I should have done. And that was, quite honestly, leave one source as a room record. So whenever you are recording, make sure that you have some sort of source. This right here is my little baby. I love it. It is a Tascam digital recorder. And these little guys run, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks uh, on the high end, you know, right up around 250 they make an eight, eight input version that's fantastic. That's right up around four hundred bucks. Uh, that you can get eight tracks of full audio on everything else. But this little guy right here is really my go-to. Uh, it's what I use for the Dudes and Beer podcast going live. It's got stereo microphone inputs as well as phantom power option and two positionable 
microphones on the inside. And the cool thing about this is that you can actually use it in four track format. So you can actually record the two built in microphones as well as the two external microphones on four different audio tracks. So um, that's, that was the function that I thought that I had activated uh, that I normally do that I did not have activated that day and therefore I lost my room audio. Um, you know, it's called the nap pops whenever you're out recording video. Uh, it's the natural sounds that are going on in the environment that really kind of build the ambiance of the scene in the background, stuff like that. And also, it's your means of dump recording. You know, if, any, if anything goes bad, you always have that audio to go back to. You know, there are a lot of things that you're out shooting live that, hey, you've only got one take. So normally on a stereo camera, you'll have left channel microphone you know camera mic and then right channel will be a wireless mic so you get all of your reporters stuff like that out in the field and then you get the nap pops on the big mic which will also catch the reporters worst case scenario uh, with a little bit of background noise so that's what i didn't have going um that's really the process for setting up a live record is making sure that you have some sort of live backup and, you know, sitting there monitoring, you know, granted, whenever I'm doing a podcast, I don't always, I really do have to uh, set it and forget it, man. You know, there's a lot of it uh, that is set it and forget it, but there's a lot of it that, good God, man, if I could have somebody behind the board all the time, my world would change. Uh, my my attitude would change up here because I literally wouldn't have to worry about those records, those playbacks, those, hey, you know, how are things sounding? Um, really, there's a lot of it that I have to test my audio beforehand, take a look at it, make sure I'm happy with it, and then just roll with it, man, and fix it in post. Um, which sometimes, you know, like, perfect example, uh, the new podcast that I have, Dudes and Beer, which is literally just that. It's Dudes and Beer sitting around, talking about everything in the world from stuff on Facebook to, you know, movies, books, uh, what have you, uh, topics in the news, um, just life in general, projects. But the first, some of the first episodes I just recorded, I recorded with this really great microphone, um, but, you know, we, we wanted to record it outside. There were some people that brought cigars, and, you know, uh, my, brother, my brother is known to have a cigarette here and there, so, you know... Uh, I wanted people to feel comfortable. So there's some stuff that I had to take care of and post, and some of it that just kind of sounds cool because you hear the crickets and the locusts in the background, you know. On occasion, you'll hear the fan go go by because, well, we live in Texas, and it's it's like right next to Satan's back door as far as temperature goes. It is uh, a, a beautiful, balmy 100-something degrees at 10 o'clock at night. You know, in Katy, Texas, while we're recording these episodes, and we're all out there just pouring sweat out uh, from <laughs> from drinking beer and trying to drink water at the same time while we're doing a show, and it was it was fantastically fun. But the big thing is, what do you do with that in post? You know, there's only so much that you can control on site whenever you're trying to create an ambiance, whenever you're trying to do something. So, having a backup record rolling is highly important uh you know it makes sure that you have some means of capturing what is there because uh, there's some stuff that you just can't script it happens magically it happens organically and when it does that's the beautiful stuff that's the stuff that you really really don't want to lose uh so on that that's how to set up backup recording now on archiving which is which is really where this issue comes in um is taking your stuff from point a to point b and then holding it in perpetuity uh one of the things that spawned this episode was the posting of a picture um of a piece of half inch uh ampeg real tape that is the master for uh, the Watchmen soundtrack, one of the one of the masters for the Watchmen with the Simpty time code to sync to film, all that kind of stuff. Um, great, awesome. Uh, a buddy of mine posted it up. A friend of his was trying to get rid of it. He was like, "I will take it." Chris, can you transfer this for me? 
And I was like, I will do my best to track down a half-inch reel and get that taken care of for you. But it really got me to thinking, you know, Watchmen came out close to a decade ago. And the fact that it was still on reel-to-reel, number one, shows it is not a dead format. Analog is still there. Number two, the importance of properly archiving something. Proper archiving. Ah, proper archiving, excuse me there. Proper archiving is paramount. It's huge. I'm an analog freak, and for years, this has been my medium right here. A tape. Just a standard cassette tape. You know, just the other day I was talking to a musician who came by off Craigslist and purchased a CD recorder from me. Uh, I had a few of them, so, you know, I'm kind of thinning the herd on some used gear and posting a lot of stuff up for sale on Craigslist. Um, and the guy was literally looking for something to dump down his digital audio tracks. Uh, he was like, I record everything, I record all my drums on an analog four track machine with standard cassette right here. Uh, this is just a Sony 90 minute, and believe it or not, they're getting harder and harder to find. That beautiful sound, I love it. The sound of a cassette tape. Um, they were kind of making a comeback with the throwback crowd, you know, stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of artists I know. Um, an artist here locally, Artificial Earth Machine, just released his album. Uh, I believe it's Genesis is the title. Uh, we're supposed to be having him in. I need to contact him about coming on. But uh, he released his on analog tape. And, uh, you know, it really is a beautiful, rich format, even in this version, as opposed to quarter-inch reel-to-reel. You know, um, whenever you're archiving, this right here is actually a master of an album that I did years ago uh, called Waiting at the Gates with my friend Alan Cunningham, who's been on the show before as an engineer. Um, he actually engineered the album. He mastered the album. He put it out to tape to me, and I've had it all these years. And I've traveled everywhere f with this. This lived with me in Maine. Uh, I did not take a chance of anything like that happening to my master discs. Um, most of the time, my masters traveled with me. Right now, my masters are in a closet in my mother's house in Katy, Texas for my four track. But the key to archiving things like this tape is a cool, dry environment. It can't be hot. You really, really can't have anywhere over 85, 90 degrees on the regs. Um, you've got to keep it somewhere where it's stable, uh, otherwise the carbon on it, or not carbon, but the, 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 the iron oxide, the rust, basically, tape is a piece of tape, just that, cellophane, just like you wrap a Christmas present with. It's tape with iron oxide rust on it, and that magnetic head aligns those rust particles in the same waveform that you're speaking in, or that you're putting music in, and it remembers it there, and then the playhead reads that magnetic pattern, you know, and then whenever you erase it, um, the, the magnetic pattern is lost. And much like if you took a uh, man-made magnet, you know, if you've ever been in science class and made a magnet with a needle and a magnet, you know, rubbing it a couple hundred times one way, and then that needle becomes a magnet, well, if you bake that magnet, it will bake that weak electric field off of it. That's what you do to big tape to reuse it. You either use a large bulk demagnifier to take the magnetic field off, which, you know, you had to have an FCC permit to have one. Uh, I had one that I purchased from an old guy in Houston uh, who used to go to estate sales and sold all that kind of stuff. And he was like, hey, just so you know, you're technically not supposed to have this. You know, and literally I had a big old FCC warning on it. And I remember I had an analog watch on. I made sure to put all my credit cards in another room, put all my tapes in another room, all that. But I did not take off my watch and it didn't even dawn on me. And yeah, that watch never, ever worked again. But, <laughs> but yeah, you know, if you store these analog tapes out in a hot garage, they will lose their magnetic field. You will, just like storing them in a hot car, you will start to lose fidelity. You will start to hear wash. You'll start to hear all that kind of stuff. So properly taking care of and storing tape, just like one of the big secrets people don't realize, there was always that be kind, rewind aspect uh, with videotape. Videotape is basically what they used inside of DATs. Um, inside of DAT machines for high-end studio recording. Well, the one thing that most people don't realize is that tape is best stored in a played position. 
that is when the most tension is on it. So you don't want a lot of slack where the tape can get hung up, where it can mung up the works, stuff like that. So you really want to store it in a played position instead of rewinding it and having slack in it from it moving it moving fast. So uh, really the best way to rewind a tape is to flip it over, move the reel, and then play it backward so that it has the same tension on it again. Um, but that's kind of tough to do with a cassette tape. Um, but just so you know, always store them in a played position. Uh, you'll find that you end up with a lot less slack in your, in your tape reel than what is normal. Now, as time has moved on, mediums have moved on. Uh, things have started going digital. Uh, I was unable to find, I didn't have time to go to storage today, um, but I was unable to find a mini disc, one of my personal favorite formats. Uh, because what we're about to talk about is CDs. Now, CDs provide a whole different realm of fidelity. Um, you don't quite have the headroom that you have with analog tape. That's for certain. Between the two of them, I would probably stick with analog tape most of the time. But as far as the storage medium goes, CD all the way, man. You can take those analog tracks, just like I was telling the guy that bought the CD burner from me, Take your analog tracks from your four track, output them one at a time, and record them to CD, and now you have them in full digital CD quality format that you can rip off, you know, rip off the CD into a digital format, play around with inside your digital mixing programs, your DAWs, um, Reaper, Cubase, uh, Pro Tools, what have you, um, even GarageBand, stuff like that. So, um, CDs really do still offer a great, great uh, medium for hard storage. I'm a big fan and big, big proponent. It takes a lot of room, you know. Whenever you go to a studio, there's that mastering fee, you know, and you, you can pay the studio to keep a master copy of your tape or your CD, all that kind of stuff. And really, it's an archivization process, and it's making sure that your things are archived. Not only that, but that it stays with the master notes, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the plus side about that is that you don't lose it. If you can pay the extra money for that master, always keep it. Always keep your master. You never know if you're going to move somewhere, you know, what's going to happen in life where you may want to have that with you. And to be able to have an actual master of your stuff in hand um, to duplicate off of, that kind of thing, is very important. Now, storage of CDs is key. You have to make sure that the surface itself does not get scratched. You know, you can find some very high-end uh, CD cases that have... Uh, neoprene, things like that on the inside that keep these, even while they move, from scuffing around on the bottom. But always make sure to keep your CDs in a place where they're not going to move around, where they aren't going to jostle, uh, spin. Um, don't ever clean them in a circular motion. Clean them in a motion from inside to outside whenever you're doing it. Straight lines, never in a circle. Uh, those big swirls tend to uh, confuse the lasers, stuff like that, and tend to scratch things a whole lot faster. Um, so archiving to CD is a great process. The only issue that you have uh, with CD is that you're limited to the 800 megabytes of CD. With DVD and with dual layer DVD, you can go a little bit further, especially with large stem track projects, um, things like that. It's pretty common for that kind of stuff to be stored in a DVD medium uh, and be kept. So CDs and DVDs are one great way. Now, more common nowadays is actually the hard drive. This right here is actually the hard drive that I keep right here in the uh, studio space. Um, I have a little Mika player that I use for a while. I'm just kicking around to play movies, music on, things like that. And I also use it as an emergency dump drive. If I happen to forget my capture hard drive at home, something like that, there is about 500 gigabytes of a terabyte free on this. So in a pinch, I can capture my video to it, something like that. And I always have a hard drive here to dump an audio project to something of that sort. Um, media is really getting cheap nowadays. You can get to where... Uh, it's close to a dollar a gigabyte. Um, you can find it cheaper than that, uh, especially if you're a member of things like Amazon, 
um, Amazon Prime, that kind of stuff. You can really, really find some great daily deals. I've had this hard drive for a couple few years. That's the plus side is that most of these, uh, this isn't a solid state one. My new one that I have is. Um, solid states become all the rage uh, since thumb drives and compact flash came about and started really taking over the market in that end of storage. Um, these tend to run right up around the $89 area for a one terabyte. Like I said, you can be guaranteed to pay between 75, to, 75 cents to a dollar a gigabyte. Um, this is a terabyte hard drive, so this this will run you right up around seventy nine dollars at most stores, most big box stores, or even online. Um, it's by Seagate. Uh, it's fantastic, been rock solid. Used it for years. Used it on the road for years. Just retired it in favor of a two terabyte to be on the road with me. Um, I also have a one gig, uh, one terabyte solid state that I built for capture and that one cost me I think about 125 to build something like that now another personal favorite the thumb drive thumb drives are getting cheaper and cheaper like I said solid state storage has gotten to where it's about a dollar a gigabyte so um, I use so many thumb drives I actually have a little key ring I've I have adopted these groovy ones um, by Kingston Kingston makes these. They're made out of milled aluminum, and they're one piece, no moving parts, anything like that. So no parts that you can break or that get hung up or that, you know, oh, my God, my thumb drive just fell apart. Um, that was always an annoyance to me. Um, they're nice. They're milled aluminum. You can get some that are made out of titanium if that's your gig. Uh, there are some really nice ones. I want to say I just bought a 64 gig of this Kingston for the for the thumb drive in my car and it was something like $22 um, and that was on Amazon Prime now which was delivered to my doorstep within two hours absolutely amazing but um, these are even handy for those engineers that are out in clubs all the time you know if you have priorities that you're used to using on certain boards you know on Midas boards Behringer boards um, yeah I said it Behringer ooh you know they have digital boards too and they're becoming more commonplace to see out there um, all kinds of boards uh, avid consoles everything runs off of a thumb drive nowadays where you can literally take your thumb drive pop it in there and have your entire last show dialed up you know the PreSonus board is actually uh, the the 16 live is easier to use with a tablet than it is on the board itself that's how things have gotten so you really do have to kind of learn to carry these things with you this is this is a thing that lives on my key ring I never leave home without it it's got info for my websites my podcasts um, personal files backup programs that I can use on the fly all kinds of things um, so that is some concepts and ideas for storage for all of your media and making sure that you're backed up for the future making sure that these projects that you do and that are your passion do not get lost to the ages man um, I, I hate hearing that from people whenever they're like dude I used to have this great recording from my band man and I it just disappeared and I don't have it anymore you know because we couldn't transfer it so I got rid of it and it really makes me weep inside as a musician myself um, who every song I ever wrote, I still have the original page of lyrics and chords for. Same thing with poetry that I wrote. Um, for some reason, I thought it important to keep all of that. You know, I have a very good friend of mine, Billy, who used to literally write stuff and just throw it. Just, ah, you know, that's what he did. And, you know, it was kind of a therapy thing. You know, hey, you write it, you throw it away, you move on to the next. It was a beautiful concept, come to think of it. Um, but it just wasn't me. For some reason, I wanted to keep everything. And I did the same thing with music. I still have all my master tapes. Uh, I care for them. I make sure that they're proper. And someday I will transfer them all down to full digital. You know, they've all been transferred at one point, but they haven't been transferred, remixed, all that kind of stuff. So one day, the 37, 38 hours of music that is Christopher Jordan will be remixed and digitally compiled. <laughs> But until then, everybody, while you're looking for the music online, please feel free to stop by and check us out online. www.talkingsoundshow.com is the website. There you can find all the technical articles. Uh, you can find 
uh, technical episodes, tips, tricks. Uh, we have all kinds of articles from major manufacturers as well as video episodes and audio. We just recently put forth to be accepted into the iTunes market uh, via popular request, so uh, that will be coming up soon. Please feel free to visit us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash talking sound. There you can give to the cause. Um, everything that we give away here, literally we give away. We do not charge for membership to the podcast, to the video portion of the podcast, anything. Everything is given away for free because all of this knowledge was gained by me on site. So um, I firmly believe in giving knowledge back to the people and giving, giving back to the next generation. That's what I started this podcast for, was to teach up-and-coming people, was to give people a leg up. Um, so please, please, um, share your knowledge with other people, share your talent, share your skills with other people, and whatever you do, make sure to back up so that you can pass this stuff on to future generations and make sure that your ideas don't just disappear into oblivion. So on that note, everybody, please, please keep on reaching for 11. And until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.